so much for coming. Um, for some reason, I still have to read this off a piece of paper. I'm sorry, every time. But um, thank you, everyone, for coming to our fourth artist talk as part of the Winnesquatucket Greenway Arts Project. Um, and we wanted to thank the City of Providence's Art, Culture, Tourism Department, uh, who helped fund this project through an Our Town grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. Uh, the bigger scope of the Winnesquatucket River Greenway Arts Project is showcasing temporary public art and performance along the Greenway, including performance projects by the Manton Avenue Project and Wilbury Theater Group, sculptural animal habitats developed by the Winnesquatucket River Watershed Council and Steelyard Artists, a lighting installation by Waterfire Arts, and gallery exhibitions in the storefront window of the Dirt Palace. Um, and this has all happened, it started in October of last year and is running through August. Um, this is the fourth Artist Talk event that we're hosting. Um, as part of the project, Dirt Palace has commissioned seven artists to make new work in conversation with the river, its history, and the future plans for the neighborhood Greenway for our storefront window gallery. Um, we're happy to present Invasive, um, an installation by artist Matt Tracy. Uh, tonight he's going to discuss his work with local poet, writer, and visual artist Mary Kim Arnold. So. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it off to them. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really honored and happy to be here tonight and to be able to talk with Matt Tracy. Um, Matt and I actually used to be neighbors um, what's now probably almost 20 years ago when I lived on Almy Street before I moved to Pawtucket. Um, so there feels like something very circular and cyclical about uh, being back here to have this conversation and cycles is something that I think Matt will talk a little bit about tonight. By way of introduction, Matt Tracy, as many of you know, is a painter and map maker, occasional maker of three-dimensional mixed media work, and co-owner of Red Planet Farm in Johnston. We first met back in um, what I started calling the late 1900s. Matt explains in his bio that this last year marks a return to the studio after focusing for many years on the running of the farm. Those interactions, it seems, between the vibrant, energetic, exuberant paintings I've seen, a few that seem to be pulsing with life and energy, and the close, sustained, and devotional attention to the earth and to the water, both as farmer and as map maker, make this window installation seem to me a particularly apt manifestation of Matt's ongoing interests and concerns. The window installation is called Invasive, and when I asked Matt how he started thinking about the approach to it, he says, mostly I knew I wanted to fuck around with plants. Over the last few weeks, he's been collecting and propagating both native plants and invasive weeds from along the Winasquatucket. He has researched some of the natural and human history of the neighborhood. He has considered getting a small boat. He has encountered eels and people. He describes invasive as a diagram of a cycle, maybe physiological, ecological, and historical. In addition to this window, he has recently shown work at the Sky Gallery and the Fuller Speed Cafe in Providence, and has an upcoming show at the Real Estate Gallery in Brooklyn. Welcome, Matt. Hello. So I thought we'd start with something that you say in your artist statement about your 20 year long relationship with the Winasquatucket. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, maybe how you've related to it in different ways during different stages of your life? Uh, thanks Mary Kim, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah we, we, we talked a little bit about the fact that, yeah, one of the things I realized pretty quickly once uh, I was asked to do a piece that I think Literally, they said in conversation with the river, um, and or you know about the river. Think about you know when you walk you know, when you walk into this area and you look at this body of water flowing through here. What 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 do you want to make and what do you want to say? Um, I immediately thought, oh my God, I've been I've been up and down this river for years, like all the way back to when I first moved to Providence in the late 90s. I think we're calling it 98 or 99. Um, and really, like literally living in buildings like that were built in or on the river that are like slowly being like reclaimed by that river. Um, me and other people, you know, other friends of mine lived in these places and 
you know, studio spaces and show spaces and whatnot, businesses that I worked for. Um, never really got that far from the Wenaspetucket. Um, I don't know if my house is te te technically in that watershed, but it sure is close up, up on the west side. I have no idea um, where the water goes up there. But um, I do know that, like, the farm that we own, and I've been, you know, that we started back in the early 2000s, um, that's sitting on a tributary stream to the river. And the, the route that that I take to work, I live in Taunton, but the route that I take to work there, to do things there, is all along the river. And on a good day, I'm riding my bike back and forth. So I just, uh, for years, have been interacting with that, that, that water. Um, it started as just this weird thing. It was just part of life. If you had an artist space down in this industrial zone that, you know, val the Valley neighborhood and Omeville and, you know, up to Manton, if you had one of these spaces, you were, one of the, the building you were in was probably on the river. And if it was on the river, you would just, if you didn't have anything better to do, you'd just go behind the building and, like, check it out and watch the, the eels or try to, like, there was one night that, yeah, like, <coughs> they all dared each other to walk across this pipe that was, you know, this, like, asbestos-covered pipe that, like, traversed the river. And, you know, I was like, wow. That was stupid. <laughs> so, some people here have fallen in that river, I know for a fact. Do you want to call anyone out? I, I, I'm not going to do that. It's too, too much, too painful. Uh, so, yeah, so that was back then. And then, you know, like, as time goes on, you know, like, you become a little more thoughtful about the things that you do, I hope, and, like, ended up getting more involved in environmental causes and working with, with organizations that actually literally do work that cleans that river, like the one that sponsored this event, but um, also the conservation district in uh, Providence County, and uh, learned all about like stuff that I'm not trained in, but it's, you know, just enthralling, the ecology of the, 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 the watersheds, the, the impact that the farming that we were doing is, has on the watershed on a daily basis, phosphorus runoff, nit nitrogen runoff, um, the, the whole issue of like, you know, we think of farming, we think of agriculture as like a wholesome activity, and I guess it, it is a pretty nice thing to be doing in this day and age compared to like a lot of other stuff, but it has a deep impact on the, on the environment. Um, so learning about that and then learning how to do things in a way that, that um, mitigate that. Um, and then like planting pollinator habitats and filter strips and um, working with nature more, like organic agriculture approaches things that way anyway, but learning that on a deeper level over the years has really been fascinating, and learning how the forests around the farm work, and how where the water goes, what it does, and I feel lucky, I feel really, like that I was able to just sort of walk, do, do some work on the farm, and then walk out back, and just sort of stand like in the stream, and like throw rocks, and ended up building a dam, and digging ponds, and like just having that interaction with the water, and then I feel lucky that I get to do this work, because it's like, um, well, it's cyclical, that, that whole thing. And it, yeah, you could cut me off any time. <laughs> Once I start going on the cyclical stuff, it might, <laughs> never know. But well, so, so there's, a, um, there's a couple uh, questions that I have, and uh, one is that you, you mentioned that farming is its own creative practice, and for those years that you were focusing on the farm, um, it sounds like there was a lot about it that was satisfying creatively, but that you were thinking about getting back to the studio. So I wonder, um, since that is within the last couple of years of getting back to the studio, what was that like? Did you pick up where you left off? Was it strange? Oh yeah, right. So yeah, like skipping through the process of actually doing all the stuff you have to do to get, get to work again. Um, spreadsheets. <laughs> Once you get to the thing, uh, then yeah, that was, that was wild. Yeah, that was, I had a studio in the house back in the day, and so I went up there, and that, you know, it was basically, it was, it was always there, because, you know, you don't want to put that stuff away in case you get inspired or whatever, or you have, like, five minutes to spare. So, uh, yeah, I picked up, I went up there, and it was all because it was, like, this huge sense of guilt, because my friend Jim, who's not here, I don't think, like, gave me some money to make him, make him a painting one day, like, oh, you know, like, 200 years ago. And I, I went to make it, and I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then I just didn't do it, and the painting was still there. I was like, all right, I'll start with this, because 
I owed Jim money. And, um, so you had started it? I had started it, but I never finished it. So I got to work on that, and um, that was, that was I feel like that was the only way to, to have that little anchor. Was like, was it, um, but that was really hard, and it was, took a few weeks of just sort of banging my head against the wall and not being able to think. But then I, I, felt, I was like, oh, I, I, okay, I, this is starting to be fun, and I'm like making stuff that I care about. Um, so that felt really lucky. Like it couldn't just been like, ah, no, I'm not, I'm not good at this anymore. I don't like this anymore. Um, so, would you say that um, your time away changed your approach to your work, or do you feel like you're sort of thinking about the same things? Um, I'm probably thinking about the same things, uh, but the approach is different. Hello. Oh. The approach is different um, in that. Yeah, I think we discussed a little bit, like learning how to work and learning how to like um, create, like I felt like when I was a younger person, all of the thoughts and all the creative energy was all jumbled together and it was all like really hard to separate different parts of my life and, and do them effectively. Um, and I feel like in the interim, I learned how to, I learned how to like, yeah, work in an organized way and, and approach something it sounds really boring and sterile, maybe, but as a project, and like think through, like, okay, this is what I want to do. And you talked about um, going back from, like, going back, like working, solving back from the goal, and like thinking, like, what do I need in order to do this? What do I need in order to do that? And, and then doing that again, it's you know, it, it, whatever, it is what it is. But it it made it so I could actually just sit and make work and and not. Um, had it be all like clouded and messed up by like feelings I was having about other stuff that was going on, or all the other work that I was trying to do, like getting in the way of it. Like, right. yeah. So, um, when you started talking about your relationship with the river, I just want to go back to um, something that you said about, um, you know, so you had this relationship with the river in various ways, and I wonder if when you thought about this particular project, you had to approach it in a little bit of a different way. Like, I know you talked about some of the research that you did. I wonder if you want to talk about any of the um, things that you learned about the way the river has changed, the way the city and the relationship with the river has changed, or the neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, I, it's a little bit hard to separate out the things that I learned as a result of working on this and the things that I had been interested in before. But I think... Um, Having a, having a, that sort of question asked, like to do to do work based on this, I, I had never, I probably never would have done that on my own. It wasn't. It's not like the work that I do doesn't typically have a concrete basis in reality. Um, it's not like I don't make historical like dioramas or anything like that. Um, but and I didn't. This is not that either. <laughs> but. Um, but uh, I feel like what I. Yeah, the thing that as I the well, first of all, I got I got a chance to just have a whole bunch of really cool conversations with people. And so the first the, one of the first things I learned like back like last fall when I started thinking about all this was like there are so many people that want to talk about water and um, sewage and um, water supplies and the politics around it and current threats to all of these systems that we have and, the, and those are just the built systems and then. People want to talk about the, the you know, other other people or the same people who are just enthralled by the, the you know the natural world in, in our our little you know part of Rhode Island um, and I was surprised and delighted by how many people had opinions and had stories and had an interest in the topic and um, this winter I, I ended up um, going to a conference in uh, in Texas that was a, a the National Conference on the, uh, the, the National Association of Conservation Districts, and the, so the conservation districts are groups that are like uh, the it, basically their 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 mission is soil and water protection, and they, this was those districts from all over the country, and it was like wild to be like in cabs and stuff going around in these towns. I in San Antonio never been there, I don't know people there, but just like having people come up and be like, "What are you doing here?" and tell them and be like, "Oh." we've got water problems, I want to talk to you about this. And they've got a river, and they've got all these stories about their river, and the same thing, like, 
felt like everywhere I went, I, it's on people's minds. And uh, not tr I, then that's part of what I think I ended up thinking about for this. Like, that's part of what this is. So. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I know you collected these um, rhizomes, and the, uh, we talked a lot about Japanese. Not, wo not yes. wood, right? Not, not weed. Not weed. It's Japanese not, not weed. weed. It's not not weed. <laughs> Japanese not weed. It's Japanese not weed. That's the invasive. Yes. Yes. And also some native plants. Native plants. Um, yeah, I had a really, uh, that, see, yeah, one of the first uh, sort of talks I had well, not one of the first. One of the talks I had was with the, one of the other artists that did work here, Stowe, and um, we had a great walk down, like, <coughs> he, he wanted to walk the river, and I was like, sure, I love that, and so we took a walk, and one of the first things we found was this patch over by Price Street that fascinated me, because it was, partly because it, it was not weed growing in a manicured environment. It was like a, a grassy, a grassy little, you know, one of those grassy patches that they mow, and it looks like you could have a picnic there, but nobody ever does, near price rate. And, um, what's that? That stuff? That's the knotweed? Yeah. That's it? Oh yeah, that's, that, those are dead stalks and knotweed. Sometimes I can't hear myself. All right. Um, yeah, and so, we went down there, and this stuff is like, it's bright red, and like, you know, well not bright red, this, what would you call that? It, this like, is that auburn? <laughs> it's got redness to it and like it's striking when there's snow on the ground and there's ice on the river it just really is beautiful and it, it reminded me a little bit of like Melania Trump's Christmas decoration <laughs> the, 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 de the dead delicate icy beauty and the, the <laughs> um, and it was and it was, it, there's these pure, it, when it's in a pure stand, you really notice it. And like, in this case, it was also growing in with what, which, what I had always thought was red osier dogwood, which is a native. And it's also a pretty invasive plant. It's, it'll go crazy if you let it. Um, someone, I, uh, another friend that thought it might, that, that plant that I thought was dogwood was a viburnum. I'm not sure, but it's, it's pretty pervasive in the, in the watershed. And, it's, the, the two plants were just intertwined, and they both had these, right, you know, like really strong root systems, and so they, you couldn't, I was trying to dig this stuff up to take, to take cuttings, or to take rhizomes, and you couldn't get, like, they were all just like, grow, there was just it, there was no way to separate them, like, in order to kill this knotty, you would have to kill all of the plant material, plant matter on that riverbank, and that's all the riverbank is over there, it's dry laid stone from God knows when, that somebody channelized the river in the 17 or 1800s to, ma to make mills, and that's what's still there. And then all these plants, specifically the knotweed and the red osier dogwood, I think, are growing just in and in that, in those blocks and in that, in those walls, and just like tearing them apart slowly, so that eventually the the walls are going to fall down. And, and it, it happens here, you know, like across the street, you can see it. Um, like it's it, when where they built the buildings right in the river. Like these these and other trees are just like going right into the foundations and, and growing and growing and growing and eventually they'll just compromise uh, the the built environment. So that's that's wild to watch and think about. Um, did I did I go off on it? No, that's good. Did, okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> but I was gonna um, also so you know you have the uh, cuttings that you planted right. and that are growing, and I wondered if there were other, or do you want to talk about those? <coughs> I'll, I'll grab one real quick. Yeah. For visual aid. that's really common on the river and it's all of the, everything I've talked about so far including the knotweed amazing like uh, plants for bees they make flowers that bees just like they love um, and elderberries one of those things where there was a so I went on a walk with a friend of mine I'm not sure if, if she's here but she showed me some plants that had been 
growing all through the, the what's, I don't know, this is too much of a big story, but anyway, she, she identified some plants that we could look at that were, you know, naturally occurring that hadn't been planted. So genetically, one has to imagine they've got some, uh, some unique strength. They put up with a lot over a lot of years on that river. Um, so we took cuttings from, from, from the elderberry. Um, a, lot of what, a lot of the cuttings I took were around, the, around like rising sun in that area, on, like the, on the wild side across the river, where there's been no like habitat restoration. There's a lot of knotweed. There's a lot of other stuff, too. Um, we took cut cuttings of button bush, some big old button bush plants. That, another amazing like pollinator plant that attracts a lot of different species, not just pollinators. Um, and those are doing pretty good. The, the, the elderberries, like you can do elderberry all day long. Like cuttings of elderberry are very easy to do. It's a great way to like if you want to introduce like a hedge or something on a, on a on a piece of property and you've got a relatively like moist area, like you can take just, you can just cut the elderberry in the winter and, and lay it into the ground and it will just grow. And after a couple of years, it'll just be a big, big flowery plant. With, and then you get berries, which is great. So, <laughs> so you've got those um, in the window. Are there other um, parts of the installation that you want to talk about, like the plastic bits? And yeah. Forget all the plants. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the plastic is all this little greenhouse plastic. Uh, Do you want to talk about your thumb? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the first, so once I stopped like, jibber jabbering and got to work, I was like, all right, time to make some stuff and put it in the window. And like, I wanted to use, I wanted to work with this greenhouse plastic because I've got tons, piles of it. A lot of the piles of it are just from this greenhouse that like this farm that like died and the, the greenhouse like was abandoned and it slowly fell apart and the plastic just broke down and like started flying across the fields into our property and like I was just always picking it up like what the hell am I gonna do with this crap? These big chunks of plastic. Like this stuff here, that's what it is. Um so yeah, it's really tough. Yeah. Ready? Why don't we oh, hello. It's really tough uh, plastic. It's polycarbonate. So it's kind of hard to cut by hand. And I was like, I just wanted to cut up a bunch of pieces of it to make um, the city of Providence it, with lights and plastic. And so I, start, I was like, that's the first thing I want to do. And I started cutting, and then like I immediately cut my thumb off. And so, so the project was delayed um, a little bit. Cause, I mean, it was a whole thing. But I, I went to the hospital. Um, and in the, I was thinking 20 years ago when I lived on the river, I would, I would be like, nah, it's gonna be expensive. <laughs> nah, I'll just tape it up, and then like this thumb wouldn't exist anymore <laughs> as I speak to you today. So yeah, so that's the ghost traces. Of, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rhode Island Hospital, and thank you for the being patient as I healed my thumb. Well, I love, um, you know, thumb aside, I love that you've created this ecosystem in the window and it sort of makes me think of this um, potentially long-winded question that I'm, I promise I'll get to the point but you said something the other um, night that really haunted me and I, um, I wrote it down so you made the observation about um, the smoke from the textile mills and you know how you were looking at the history of the place and the buildings and you know going back 80 years um, that the smoke from the mills has seeped into the cells of every living thing. And that you said something, um, let's see, hold my ears away. You were talking about the plants, I think, and you said they don't make themselves from what's in the dirt, they make themselves from what's in the air. And I found it really particularly chilling because, you know, with soil, I think we at least imagine that we can always improve it, we can always make it better, um, but the air is something that we can't escape. And so in thinking about this <coughs> ecosystem, thinking about what you're saying about the interconnectedness of things, I guess I'm just wondering how, you know, working on this, the, your work with the farm, the things that you're saying earlier about the farm's impact on the um, environment, like, has, how has that affected your thinking about climate change, about other environmental concerns that are in your mind? Oh, uh, yeah, it was, um, this, I, I think it's it, because uh, 
Well, because we all know, like, in the recent couple of years, um, we've learned that we don't have a lot of time with climate change. Um, I, okay, first of all, for whatever reason, I decided to do a piece that, like, incorporated, like, a significant amount of environment, like, an environmental theme, or, like, a, a, there's a, there's a, stream of consciousness that runs through what I did that, that you can't really not call it environmental. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on there that really, obviously, the plants. Um, so, and I didn't know why I was doing that. I didn't know why I was drawn to the to thinking about invasives, other than, that, like, it's a, sort of a topic on the river. Like, it's been an ongoing campaign to, like, restore the habitat along the river and create, to, to in order to facilitate, like, a more biodiversity, as, in, like, in the long run. That's the, that's the goal. Um, and in the meantime, there's a lot of work that has to be done. If you're going to try to eradicate or control invasives, like it's kind of, it in itself is a very invasive process. So I, I was like thinking about that, but I kept coming back to like sort of this question of like, what, like why does any of this matter if like we can't we're not talking about climate and figuring out climate? And obviously, I'm not helping that, but I'm just thinking about it like what, what and then I'm thinking about the plants, and I'm thinking like. Yeah, they just have to sit here and take it. And not only do they have to sit here and take it, like they're making us take it because everything that, like this is I was sit I was talking to a soil scientist about some stuff going on at the farm. Uh, some like a program where a uh, soil health program where in and I was like, wait, I, I knew this, like you learned this in high school, but I just had like lost the, the information. But he was talking about the <coughs> I don't want to get into the weeds. Um, <laughs> he was talking about the, um, oh gosh, uh, oh yeah, organic matter, which is basically carbon. And he was talking about that, and like, uh, I, was, I was like, we were talking about removing phosphorus um, from the soil, very high phosphorus on old farm fields a lot of the time from like years of manure application, and that runs off into the bay and kills shellfish and so forth. So we're talking about controlling phosphorus, getting it out of the soil, and how you do that. And I was asking him some stuff. I was like, well, doesn't this affect the organic matter? Like, doesn't this um, reduce the organic matter in the soil? I was like, no, that doesn't change. Like, the, the carbon in the soil is the carbon in the soil. You can add to it, but, like, the day-to-day -day business of farming, you're not, you're not removing it. I was like, how is that? He's like, well, the plants aren't drawing carbon from the soil. I was like, oh, whoa, that's right. Okay, they're getting it from the air. And... All of the, and then it gets into this, and then I'm just thinking, oh yeah, these plants are just, they're just grabbing carbon. You guys all know this, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> but um, they're grabbing carbon from the air, and they're, that's what's in their cells. That's what's in the woody parts, you know, there. And that's all, like, because the air is, like, for lack of a better word, like, like, like it's, it's, a, it's fungible. Like, you put, it's all mixed together, you know. Once you put the carbon out there, it just stays there, and the plants take it in, and... Like it, that coal that was like that ancient those ancient plants that was in the coal is now like in us. Like we we're eating that. All the food we eat is that, and it's poisoning us through other means by changing the temperature of the planet. And it's just like, I don't, sorry to be. It's, <laughs> that's <not> very dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's where I, I start to get dark, and I don't mean to because like a lot of what I was thinking about was like pretty. I, I guess it's in the background, and it's something that we can all engage in, and we can all talk about, and like do something about. And I don't want to make it just like. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you know it comes back to what you were saying before about the you know the ecosystem and inextricability. Like we and and you know you had mentioned some of the research <coughs> that you've been doing about the history of the place and how we all kind of inherit that history. You know that that's something that we're still. We were joking before about how everything is a metaphor for something else, and like it feels like the what you're talking about in terms of those plants and taking in that carbon from the air is like a metaphor for the larger history questions, maybe. Yes. Um, also, I'll talk. Yeah, I'll answer the question about history, but you reminded me about something that's a, hopefully a little bit more positive in further conversations about this. I think it was maybe pointed out to me that it's a lot easier for us as animals to talk about the living things around us and in the built environment around us than it is to talk about like you know ex you know like abstract existential threats threats even though they're important. 
So we all talk about water, we talk about plants, and we talk about the, these things that we care about. And sometimes that might be, it could be that's that, that we're not, it's not that we don't care about the big things, it's that these things are standards so that we can actually just begin to have conversations about anything. And the good part about that is it, it, it's like a way to build, build a community of people that are talking to each other, <coughs> and you can get together and you can all like acknowledge the big stuff, but then work on the concrete stuff and talk about the concrete stuff and that that could that could be really great and it could lead to big bigger problems getting solved down the road um, so that's not history but yeah the history part of it is like it goes back to the evasive question I think um, that was what I the other thread that kind of like I kept following was this idea of like um, well, first it's like, how do we decide what is an exotic, invasive, invasive plant? You know, like, what, what is it doing to, to hurt us, and why is it a problem? And there's a lot of answers to that question, and there really are functional reasons why sometimes you really have to get rid of a species, because it's destroying, like, an ecosystem that we rely on, or it's destroying, like, native wildlife, like, in a really dramatic way. Um, and, but that has changed over the years, and perceptions of what is a problem have changed over the years. And, 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 like, and it can be like kind of funny stuff, or it could be really you know sad stuff. Um, you know, and it's it's fun to just sort of go back and think like, uh, what are we doing here? What's what what is what's going on with this river? Why is it like this? It's you know it's been channelized. It's been the course of it has been changed. We have removed like huge, you know, big sections of the river that used to be like essentially like marshes and wetlands, like especially downtown Providence, that section of the Winnesquitucket, almost all the way up to here. I, there was like mar there was marsh marshes and swamps and stuff before industrial crap started. Um, and also, and then I learned this from from Walker's talk. <laughs> A lot of it was just like, oh, we need a dump. <laughs> so let's just start filling. That's, that's the low spot. Let's just fill it in. Like, just because you need to dump your, your stuff somewhere. Um, so, yeah. But that's also, I guess, industrial. Um, and pre-industrial, even. Like, as soon as, as soon as Europeans got here, things just got real weird. Like, they were like, we need charcoal to make iron. We're, so let's just cut. Let's just start cutting down trees, and pretty soon, like the forest was gone, like that, because of, not because of grazing, but because of charcoal. Then there's at some point there's a woolen industry, so you have like you have people grazing sheep everywhere all through New England, and that that doesn't help the trees. Um, so you know there were no trees until like a hundred years ago, and we stopped needing them. Why did we stop needing them? Because of fossil fuels, but. Um, so, so sheep, sheep are an invasive species. <laughs> like, but that's a funny one. Like everybody likes sheep, you know, pretty much. And they don't seem that. They don't seem that like they're not revolutionizing the landscape now. Um, but they did at one time. The next window is just all sheep. I hope so. I was trying to get. I was, I had that in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stay tuned for that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess. I just want to um, maybe ask a little about like future work. Um, when we talked the other day, you were talking about just like seriousness of mid life, you know, and you know, like having had other kinds of jobs and then coming back to art. And you said something about like if you're going to do something, you're going to do it pretty seriously, you know, take it pretty seriously. And I guess I wonder what um, taking it seriously means for you in your art practice now that you're. Um, sort of making that a bigger part of your life, or what your plans are for the next thing? Oh, well, I always worry that I don't have plans. That's always a thing, but I've been trying to do that, and like, I've taken, like, being serious in the sense of, you know, trying to be nominally organized and think, think things through for more than, like, a few months at a time, um, and running a business really taught me a lot how to do that, you know, more than if I hadn't, if I had maybe done other things with my time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so being serious, like, I'm not really a, that serious most of the time, but, like, in terms of, like, approach to work and, and like, if I really love making art, then how, how does that, how do I make that come together 
yeah, thinking things through in a logical way, and, and then, but the biggest thing is just like seeking out, like t talking to people that I think I, that I admire or that I think are doing something interesting, and actually talking to them instead of just like thinking about talking to them, and asking them questions and finding out how do you do this or what what is this thing on the social medias and like or whatever you know like you know like I'm building a website now I'm like trying to think through like and I know you're building you. You're building a website, why are you doing this? And I'm like, I think because it's a good idea. Because I need some, like I'm sort of like interrogating each decision I make a little bit, not in a, like, okay, not an overly neurotic way, but just in a way where you, I'm thinking it through down the line, like, like is this going to result in something that's useful to you, or is this going to result in like a 9.99 charge on your bill, on your credit card every month that you don't <laughs> actually, doesn't help you in any way, so you think, know? Yeah, thinking about ways to like, maybe integrate the, Practices and <coughs> yeah, I think so. And then just showing up and like making stuff and not thinking about who it's for, or what it's doing, just making it and not not taking too many breaks. Um, well, no, that's not a good idea. <laughs> taking <laughs> taking breaks at good times that make sense and like yeah. take take lots of breaks. Yeah, that's, that's, what breaks. Yeah. that's what I meant to say. That's what I meant to say. I know we went in a lot of different directions, but I'm wondering if there's something that you were hoping I would ask you or wanted me to ask <coughs> you that I didn't ask oh. you. Oh, oh my God. Or just want to say. Um, I don't know. That was a lot of pressure, I know, I'm sorry. You've done a really good job of asking me questions. Um, so. <laughs> You've done a really good job of answering questions. Thanks. Um, but is there something that, about the work or about your approach to it that you wanted to talk about that you didn't get a chance oh. to? Oh, well maybe one thing I would say is like, you know, I respect the, 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 the person looking at it to make their own, to draw their own conclusions from what I made. Like, I'm talking about stuff that's on my mind, but like with everything, I mean, in my case, like when I make stuff, it's never about like one thing or two things or three things, there's always plenty of things. Um, so I might, if somebody asked me why I made that in six months, I might have a totally different Answer, and I might have like three answers right now. Like if I, but I'm, you know, I can't. I can't be like. I can't. I have to pick something. <laughs> Do you have an answer that you haven't given that you want to share about it? About the Lido? Um. Hmm. Mm. I came back. So I saw it the first time at night, and <coughs> it looked really beautiful. And then I came back in the daylight and took some photos, and it was. You know, it was um, really hard to see because of the light and the reflection. And I was just thinking about, you know, how time and that time of day sort of changed the experience of it. And I wondered if that was something that you were thinking about. Yeah, well, I, part of, like, what, why I was excited to do the window as part of that was that, like, I knew enough from looking at other people's work that there was these really interesting elements that you might not get in another gallery situation um, that I, want, I was excited to have, like that. That was, that was the different reflections at different times of the day. <coughs> um, for me, the, like the traffic out there is amazing just to be like to be in the traffic and looking at the window or to be on the sidewalk and having the traffic all around you and the traffic just never really stops out there. And to me, it's such a par part of the experience. Um, so, you know, being there and listening to traffic and watching traffic, and, and then at night the car lights, you know, flashing on the thing, all of that, yeah, it's, it's just fun to play with. And to make a piece that's about the place that where the stuff is, it doesn't make any sense. The cars are all going by and the people are going by, and, and I just happen to get a chance to make a piece about <coughs> that, that specific place. I mean, the river's right there. And to me, that feels like that could be a map of Olneyville or a map of uh, the, the, the river, the river valley here, just as much as it could be the other stuff. We're talking about. Um, well, and it's yeah. it's about the place in a way that I think you know, sort of what you're trying to do too. It reflects the environment as it captures it a little bit. I hope so. If I'm doing a doing a decent job, I hope so. Yeah, and that that diorite, that little like that cityscape thing, that that. I had made that, and I was like, I just noticed that it seemed to fit there, um, and I really liked playing with the plastic above it, and sort of doing a, you know, and a lot of the stuff I do, especially back in the day, were sort of fantastic depictions of 
the place that I lived in, you know, and I, I, lately I'm not doing as much of that, but there's a little bit where I would put local landmarks into things and local jokes and, like, um, some of that is a little bit of a throwback to that. It's like a cargo cult on one side and a mill on the other. And they, it's like this weird village that's built around like a, a crashed flying saucer. And like, <laughs> is that the, that's a thing, right? <laughs> that's here, right? The, yeah. The crashed yeah. flying saucer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sure, if you guys have. because otherwise we can't capture the audio. So even if you're a loud talker, you have to use the mic. So are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, do you have any background on what mills were emitting smoke at that time? Because the, the cut mills along here, the willow mills, are not, from my experience, not very smoke emitting. I mean, the machinery is all electric. Oh, yeah. And, and the water was partly for washing the, you know, the raw material, the raw water input. I'm uh, thinking of, like, the, yeah. once the water, like, in, uh, what, what are we thinking here, like? I mean, just this local area, you know, further into town, or uh, the Valley, yeah, you would have uh, cordless in places. Yeah, the map I made, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Um, the map, the map encompasses, like, from, Downtown to um, <coughs> up, up to well, I want to say Georgiaville Pond, so that that section of the river. Um, that's like a map from I think 1849. So that's got all the old water powered mills on it, like the Lyman Mill and so forth. And I don't know off the top of my head when they when maybe somebody here does like when coal became the source of fuel, but eventually it did. Um, and so they burned coal here for many, many years, like um, in some of these mills, um, after water became a less dependable source of power. Um, that's what I know. So yeah, that age of coal I'm talking about is like, what, 18, late 1800s through early 1900s, I think. is. I, I could be wrong, though. Well, I also may have taken your comment out of context. You were talking about carbon in the air, and I may have attributed it to something that is more general. Oh yeah, and we don't have that. We don't have smoke billowing out of smokestacks anymore. The point I made is that the that the carbon that we put into the air in 1885 is <coughs> we can't ever so get. Yeah. yeah, it's either it's either sequestered somewhere in the soil, but not enough of it is, or it's in the plant, or it's just still in the air, and then like, you know, we're all trying to figure out how to get it out of the air. So. Yeah, everything was closing down by the mid-60s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what she said 80 years ago. I think that was a number of throughout <laughs> years, like, when, when textiles really started to go out, and like, industry became less, it was polluting less because there was less of it, and... Moved to the south. Polluted yeah, America. and now it's uh, in other countries. Yeah. Hi, Matt. It's nice to see Hi, you Rich. in this like, forest of Japanese knotweed. That's how I like you. And I'm wondering, if you were this knotweed plant, where would you be? Where could I find you on the, on the river? Oh, this. <laughs> where would my favorite knot? If I was a knotweed, where would I want to be? Yeah. Oh. See, if I, was an, if I was an invasive knotweed, I would want to be on a like a clod of dirt that just had been like loosed from the banks. I was free. I was floating down the river to the next place. The Viking of not me. Uh, but if I was like maybe later in life and I wanted to settle down, I think I'd uh, get, get the spreadsheet out. There's some beautiful spots. There's some spots where there's still like a very stable natural environment where the knotweed can't compete with the, with, the, with the mature forest. So I wouldn't want to be there. I'd want to be in an area that gets like, there's like some disturbance where the trees aren't taking over. So I don't know, that spot near Price Right, I really like that. 
and you get to be with your, your widows, your dog with friends. <coughs> Everything you need. Also, like this, this really crappy section between Atlantic Mills and here, that's pretty wild too. I like that. You're growing kind of out, you're out again, out of like concrete walls and stuff. It's pretty good. That's what I'm going to go with. Oh, also next to a next to an asphalt road is sweet because you can send your roots under the road and nobody knows you're doing it for a while, and then you just pop up on the other side of the road, <laughs> and then you're free again to spread. So that's pretty good. So you got to hang out and look at old maps. Did you? I like. I don't know. I I lived in the weird looking at old maps zone and like comparing it, right? Did you find any weird stuff when you're looking at your old map and then you're marching oh. up and down the... Yeah, always, always, always. Uh, I've been looking at weird maps, old maps for a long time. Yeah, uh, the Greek tavern, I'm really fascinated by that. What was that? From I think, and I don't, I'm pretty sure that map that I used is from 1849, but I could be wrong. The Greek tavern, 1849, like what is that? Who is that? Who is the Greek or... Was it four Greeks? Like, I didn't, I don't know. So, that was interesting. What else? There's so many weird things. Um, uh, today, uh, there's like a place called Hipsy's Rock that was one of the boundaries of the city. And now it's this, it's this weird, it's this, I guess, significant, unique rock. But it's in somebody's backyard, like, I want to say in Silver Lake or something. I've never seen it. But... People used to make pilgrimages to it, like, not literally pilgrimages, but they would go and find it. Um, geez, what else? I was always fascinated with why Snake Den is called Snake Den. And never really got a clear answer, but it occurred to me when you look at old maps that, the, the, that like, they always draw the... Um, the outcropping, the ridge that runs through Snake Den, and that, to me, I created this whole probably fake mythology, that, that when you walked along that ridge, it felt like you were walking on a snake's back, and also the devil lived there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's a whole um, story by H.P. Lovecraft about the snake then that is so weird. Where you, they, yeah, so. Um, so since we live now on five acres and we have a lot of poison ivy, I remember discovering that Victorians planted poison ivy as a as an ornamental, and I've cursed them ever since that. Wow. Um, but it made me think about plants that at one time were considered either beneficial and ended up being invasive. But I'm wondering if you know of anything that's the other way around. Like, is there anything that at the time was considered evasive, but over time we came to value it. Yeah. Because as the landscape changes and as climate change kicks into gear, I'm feeling less horrified and more resigned to the fact that the plant is just going to be very different than what I know, <coughs> and maybe not weed becomes like green grass, like people love it. Like maybe things just become valued and appreciated in a different way. Um, but I'm wondering if you've ever looked up like what's a what's a plant that at one time people were terrified of or they hated it or they tried to get rid of it and then they found a value for it. That's a good question. <laughs> and if anybody else here knows the answer to that, I'm curious. I'm, I mean, I've, like, the one that everybody seen, probably knows is like tomatoes. Like, but, uh, and, and uh, I don't know about, <laughs> tell me about tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes was like, tomatoes were considered like food for like, you know, the... the well, I think it was like a lot of things. It was cult cultural, like it was like, um, what's the word? Um, oh, bigotry. It was like <laughs> the, um, the tomato was considered by the English to be this poison plant that was, you know, they called them they call like, I don't know, po poison love apples or something like that. <laughs> it's like all the things you don't want. Like, <laughs> nice, delicious sauce and love. You know, you don't want that. Um, so, like, it took a lot of 
It'd be great. Snowden would be like, no, no, that's not what happened. Why did they, what happened? I don't remember why tomatoes became a thing, but obviously with people that moved in here that wanted to eat them, they were like, no, you're crazy. Like, these are fine. Like, but I don't know the whole story about a tomato. Um, so that's one thing. What else? Oh, jeez. It was considered bad and now it's good. Just anything like that. I mean, it just seems like all these plants. Like I've battled knotweed before, but you're you're describing it in a way as having beneficial properties I never thought of. So like just thinking about ways we can think about how these things function differently. You know, CMO, like yeah, I, I, yeah. You'd be the person who's done that. I mean, you've probably battled and cultivated hundreds of plants, and you probably just think about how they function in a different way, and that might be what we have to do, right? We might have to just think about how plants are going to function in the world in a different way. Yeah, well, my answer is probably a little bit indirect to what you just said, but one of the things I, I thought about and learned when I was hanging out um, on the river for this was like, the places where people are, there, are involved and working together and talking to each other and actually just and working, the stuff is fun. Like the knotweed goes away, you pull it up, it's gone, you come back, you pull it up again, you till the soil, you do whatever you have to do to control it because you're there. It's your, your, your place, your community's place. And um, some of the best um, environmental policy that people are writing and talking about involves that kind of thing. Real, real community-based solutions to like Silly problems like 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 weeds on the river. Nobody's taking nobody on most of the river. It's just like it's nobody's property. So who's going to deal with it besides the watershed council? Like, and they only have so many resources and they do the best they can. But in places where people are there doing stuff, the, these kinds of plants they they're, they're never going to go away. But they're not really an issue because and where you let, again, mature ecosystems develop, a lot of the forests can outcompete these kinds of plants. That may or may not even be a problem. To get, but they, Well, they are a problem. Like, uh, Asian bittersweet is just like, it's on agricultural land. It's crazy. And in like anywhere, really. Um, they, it tears down trees. It, like, it's a real aggressive vine, and it's really hard to get rid of. Um, and like, a lot of it spreads just from, well, not a lot of it. But the, 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 yeah, no, a lot of it spreads from, just from birds eating the berries, so you can't really, like, do much about that. Um, so, yeah, but clearing it and just managing it and having, like, some sort of a plan to deal with it, whether it's on, you know, if you own property or whether <laughs> you're just, like, using the land or you, or you just happen to want to have, have your section of riverbank be okay. Like, um, so that's one answer to that. I don't know if it's a adequate <laughs> I have a not weed fact. <laughs> a not weed fact? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can say that, like, a lot of the um, invasive plants, especially not weed, like, if not weed is one of the most, like, potent um, Lyme disease herbs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's writing, I mean, I've taken it for a long time, but there's, like, writing about how, like, as Lyme disease becomes endemic in a region, not weed usually follows it. So that's. There's like some cool writing about invasive plants and like disease that I can send to you. But yeah. Well, more. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Hey Matt, do you have you have some? A song? No. <laughs> um, do you have you have some plants here? Yes. That you've cultivated. Yes. Um, we, like I said, I went out and got these cuttings and rooted them here at the Dirt Palace. And a lot of them made it. Um, some of them are in the window, but I also had this idea that maybe if people want want any, they could take them. They're on the table back there. It's all I put out. I put out button bush and um, and uh, knotweed. So please plant now. I put out button bush <laughs> and uh, <laughs> elderberry. Everybody's mad at me about knotweed. <laughs> I'm not gonna plant those. I'm just gonna. Yeah. Those? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we were just gonna maybe ask if people want them. They could do it like pay what you can donation and, and take a plant. And then what's unique? Ah, what's unique about the plants is 
they're cutting from this, like, from right here on the river. They're, they're um, you know, they, they, they've been here, trying to grow here for, for millennia. And um, so they're, if you believe in evolution like some people do, um, <laughs> These are, these are um, ostensibly adapted to their environment in a unique way that you, you wouldn't get from nursery stock or I've bought, I've bought quote-unquote native plants to, from Pennsylvania, you know, a lot, of, a lot of big nurseries are not in Rhode Island, so. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, our next uh, event will be with Andrew Moon Bain. Um, date TBA, but hope that you can make it for that talk as well. And thank you to both Matt, Tracy, and Mary Kim Arnold. Thank you.